So, uh, Paul, we're introduced by producer Katie, Katie Forte. And uh, it's you you work in a really interesting uh, world. And, you know, when I hear of uh, IMG, which you run for Endeavor, as well as On Location, uh, I, I think back uh, when I was a kid, uh, a small kid, Arnold Palmer was... Uh, was uh, the rage in the golf world, and the golf world was a fraction of what it is today. And I remember reading about this partner, his name, Mark McCormick, who I think at that time was from Cleveland. And of course, Arnold Palmer was from uh, central Pennsylvania. And I just thought it was really interesting that they took that brand in that little known industry, little known sport industry of golf, and they created something marvelous from it. And there's very few times in business where someone has created something where there wasn't something before. It was a whole new way of thinking, acting, and building business together. And uh, and IMG, of course, is uh, that the company that came out of those activities. And I, I wonder how you, uh, as you run the company today, and it's become so much more than that probably Mark could even have envisioned, what do you what do you think of the state of the world today and how IMG has survived as a as a real catalyst for change in a, in an industry that didn't exist much before Mark decided it should? Wow, you covered a lot of unbelievable history in a very short period of time, and I appreciate that a lot. And yet you're clearly a golfer, and so your knowledge of this of the sport and the history there is just phenomenal. And you're right. I, I mean, first of all, I just want to clarify. I have the privilege of being uh, in my role over IMG events and on location. And while an IMG is a very large entity, it's a, it's a very strong brand in, within the world of Endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to run a piece of it, which is the events side of the business, which is really focused on sports, entertainment, uh, arts, culture. Um, and I can go over a little bit about what that portfolio is, but we, we own and operate key events around the world in under the IMG umbrella in that regard. Golf being one of them. And we do a lot in golf globally. We've been involved in golf from the core. And you're right. The history of IMG is centered, was centered in what Mark McCormick's vision was way back then in order to create that kind of um, company and in order to super serve one of his passions is the way I understood it. Now, I, don't, I never spent time and worked with Mark. I joined the company when uh, uh, in the last four years, but um, but I do know the history pretty well, being in the industry, watching it and, and seeing it grow. Um, and, and the way we think about the value of any company like IMG or On Location, or even more broadly Endeavor, which I'm privileged to be a part of, I uh, it, it's, it's our passion for the work we do and the businesses that we serve. And sports is one of them. You know, we, we clearly are in every aspect of entertainment and every aspect of what people want to go do or see and uh, and, and participate in. Um, and passions come in all shapes and sizes. But as an avid golfer like yourself, golf is a very big part of that. You know, it's funny that you talk about sports and entertainment and it's sort of in the same breath. But that's not always been the case. The sports was very different than entertainment. And uh and people didn't think about marketing sports and about uh, blending events and sports and entertainment all together. That's that's still relatively new, isn't it? It's it, it, it's new. It depends on what the perspective is, right? Because it seems people are going to go to this event. Geez, we have to fill up their time with other activities if they're going to travel from all over the country to come to this unbelievable event. And the unbelievable. That became more unbelievable because of the event professionals who said, oh, we can create this experience and we'll do that. And it seems that's where it really started to, to congeal. Yeah. Look, my mom tells me stories all the time about her dad was a, uh, a New York City police officer. And one of their fam uh, my, one of the favorite stories I love her talking about is how she lived across from Ebbets Field in Brooklyn and would go with him to the Dodgers games regularly. And just what an incredible day and afternoon that was uh, as, a, as a form of spending time with her father and then also in, in how she got entertained. And then on the flip side of it, how um, I, I, you know, I, I know my youngest is a professional musician and how he works and how people, the delight they have when they go see him and his band perform and 
in a lot of ways, there's a there's a similarity to that. Now, I'm going to take you back a second, and you know, my as my as you outline my history is I I spent a lot of time in the media world, and in in a big chunk of that was in magazines. And the way we thought about magazines is we had magazines that in the company that I was in that were are, were in every category of business. There was sports, there was entertainment, there was for, uh, business, there was uh, food, there was parenting, there was everything. And the way we always said was. You know, it was, we, there was only a limited amount of world's events that were happening at any time, like like the Olympics. And and every one of our brands had a view of what was happening at the Olympics. Sure. What were they eating there? What were they watching? Who was winning? Who? What celebrities were there? Whatever. Every brand had a different view. And that's because entertainment comes with a lens of what you want to see and do and participate in. I will tell you that no one is one-dimensional. Everyone is multidimensional. On the on-location side, I talked about IMG events, but on-location is the partner to major rights holders around the world. Some of them are IMG brands, some of them are not. And we work with, uh, with rights holders to help connect their consumers to their biggest events with great seats, of course, but hospitality and more importantly, incredible immersive experiences, which really, helps people get closer to the event. Now, what we're seeing are people that do that with us in sports because they love sports, but they also go to some of the music festivals with us. Some of them go to Barrett Jackson, a business that we also co-own uh, with the founder and uh, and we and, and because they like they collect cars. Or go to Freeze Art Fair, which IMG uh, runs and owns because they love art and art collecting. So entertainment comes in every bucket. It's basically in my mind, it's what do you do when you don't work? That's entertainment. You go watch a game on television or in person. You hang, if you eat uh, great food or have beautiful wine with friends, you travel, if you collect or you see music, whatever it is, that's entertainment. And that's very much the way we think about it at IMG on the ownership and operated side of events, and then on location on the premium experience side of it. It seems like from your publishing background, you spent a lot of time at Time Inc. And it seemed that Southern Living was the title in that portfolio that was the most forward in thinking about a relationship with an audience that was more integrated and beyond print. Southern Living did it beautiful job of creating multiple dimensions, inclusive of product lines and um, travel experiences and working with a lot of, um, uh, they became very integrated and in, ingrained in, in the markets that they best serve. It was a great example, but we had many of them. Uh, Sunset was another one, which had an incredible immersive experiences on the West Coast. But then broadly, when you look at them, bigger properties that we worked on. And I had the privilege of being associated with the people brands in style entertainment weekly for a very long time. And each one of those um, immersed into their worlds as well. Like we on the entertainment weekly or the people side, we got deeply involved in the award shows, um, the uh, philanthropy of what celebrities were doing um, releases and great movies and music. Uh, it was, it was very much, integrated and ingrained into those those worlds from not just an editorial standpoint from but from a consumer immersion standpoint and we we spent a lot of time with I had great partners working there and in martha nelson our our editor in chief and david guyton our, our uh our head of finance and a business partner and we we worked really hard together to to not just report and that, which is what Martha was responsible for, but to truly integrate and immerse. And that happened across all the properties. So Southern Living is a great example of what they did in markets, but it was literally the philosophy of timing at the time. Uh, when you think of uh, uh, how entertainment and uh, licensed properties all have, uh, co uh, co-mingled, I think theme parks probably had a lot to do with that too. Uh, Disney, of course, for their own properties. And then uh, in more recent times when you have... Uh, different events like uh, the Bobby event, uh, the Bobby uh, Bobby doll event. Uh, of course, you just had the huge hit with a movie. But now how else is that? How else is that franchise brought to the consumers and all its different iterations? Barbie is a wonderful example of the way IMG thinks about uh, immersive experiences. 
And, you know, the, the way we, we thought about it, Barbie and the team that worked on it did such a phenomenal job is they knew the, the impending zeitgeist that was going to happen with Barbie, or at least they assumed it would. And it actually was been an incredible success as a movie and, 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 but it's been an incredible product success through the, uh, through Mattel for a very long time. And we, what we did is we worked with our partners to create a multi room immersive experience in Santa Monica where people can go and enjoy the world of Barbie and see the history of Barbie, of all the Barbie dream houses and, the, and the, all the Barbie dolls to go into uh, a Barbie camper to get your photo uh, taken in one of the boxes as if you are Bobby, similar to what you did in the movie theaters. Uh, you, you could dive into a pool um, that like in the Barbie pool. And, and then you can ultimately design your own Barbie um, at the end. And it was, you know, everything from fashion and beauty and hair. It's so good that we're going to bring it out to other markets. And when we bring it out to other markets, it's because Barbie is timeless. The movie is wonderful, but Barbie's timeless. Now we're also doing other events, like we're doing a Harry Potter immersive experience where you can walk through a Harry Potter hidden forest. That's incredible. We, um, when we do Winter Wonderland in uh, in Hyde Park in in London this this winter, which we've done for the last number of years. That is an immersive experience as well. That's got people. You can go and explore different aspects and dive deeper into the world of of, of the holidays. Um, we are going to be doing and continue to do more skating rinks in multiple markets. We just did one last year in London. We're going to continue doing that in other places too. We what, have, what do you mean? Is that a, a themed event, a temporary event, or yeah, temporary event? We can go ice skating in a really unique location. And um, and these are you know this is the way IMG thinks about their owned and operated events. What kind of talent uh, uh, stable it, would you have at an IMG events, Paul? where you have the creatives and the engineers and the mechanics, the people who can dream these up, make it come together and then produce them. So a great range of talents there. That's, that's yeah. peculiar. We have an amazing team, absolutely amazing team. Uh, you know, the, the ranging from all aspects of experts within the space from culinary, immersive experiences, music, um, the arts and entertainment side of IMG has done a tremendous job of developing and executing unique events. We're launching one in Houston in November called Honeyland, which is an incredible experience that we're partnering with Live Nation, which will be a celebration of culture in music and culinary. Um, and uh, we're really excited about that. You know, there's there's an, an incredible array of hundreds of experiences that we build. And on the sports side of it, we're really proud of some of the places that we technically own, like the Madrid Open is a great example of a tennis event. Um, it's, you know, it's it's one of the more important events leading into the uh, into the seat as the season begins in March. And it's grown in popularity. It's an incredible culinary as well as tennis experience. Um, and it's one that we're really proud to to have and, and to, to nurture. Um, we're in great partnership. Uh, with in, in Miami on the Miami Open, another great, not only great partnership, but a tremendous experience that incorporates tennis and the celebration of tennis, but of course, everything that Miami has to offer as well as uh, um, as culinary. And, and all of that takes place, by the way, in partnership with the, with the Miami Dolphins down in Hard Rock Stadium. It's a unique uh, tennis experience because of that. And do you own that event or you just produce it? We, we own it in partnership with the Miami Dolphins. Oh, I see. Okay. And we we work on developing out experiences in sports and entertainment and culture. I mentioned Freeze and Barrett Jackson as well in order to really uh, build uh, from ground up unique experiences for people who love those uh, for whatever they want to go to. I will go move over to the allocation side, which we work way more broadly on that very same topic. So like, for example, at Fashion Week, which by the way, is run by WME, so owned by Endeavor. Um, it's, it's, it always has been historically a fantastic experience. On location partners with our, part, our internal sisters and brothers over at, on the fashion side of it to, uh, to develop immersive experiences uh, for people who want to experience Fashion Week 
in the most extraordinary way. So, so give us, that's an example. Fashion Week's been around for a long time. It was a little thing, you know, just to get a little spark into uh, people's curiosity and interest. It was a, a PR event of sorts. And now to make it immersive, what would be an immersive experience around Fashion Week that uh, would draw, draw the general public in to say, yeah, I want to experience that? Well, Fashion Week isn't always open or never really was open to the general public. I mean, a lot of it has been for the industry. And I, I had gone to Fashion Week for many years um, on the industry side of it. And I can see how you dressed. I could tell. <laughs> you're very kind. <laughs> With Fashion Week, we, you know, when you think about like as an editor, what would you experience if you went to Fashion Week? Well, you'd have a great seat, maybe even in the front row. You'd get special access and walk through. You wouldn't wait on lines. You'd have a green room. Maybe you got dressed for it, going to a couture uh, um, uh, to see a couture portfolio in order to pick out what you want to wear and go get dressed. You'd get okay, you got restaurant that. reservations. You'd have transportation. Maybe you take your photo, um, you'd get merchandising and, and memorabilia, having your photo taken with and meet and greets with designers and models. And so I can go on and on and on. That's the notion of on location is we we think about if you were the most inside person, what would your experience be like? Like if I if if I if, you know, if I went to uh, fashion week with a fashion editor, what would I what would that experience be for me? That's what I we see. try to design and bring to market for our guests. That's so clever. Boy, uh, I know a sport that could use more of your magic. Baseball. <laughs> so we, we do partner with Major League Baseball. They're a fantastic partner of ours on the on-location side. Oh, give us an idea what you're doing with MLB. Our guests got to experience All-Star Weekend like an insider. Um, aside from amazing seats and hospitality, which is sort of customary at these days, but they got to have special tours and immersive experiences. They got to meet legendary players. Um, they got tremendous uh, products and and uh, and, memor and access to memorabilia. Um, they were at Home Run Derby. They were at um, at the game itself. They and hotel and uh, dining experiences, no. uh, special parties. Um, they were like as if they were an invited guest from Major League Baseball. And um, so clever. Our, and and our partners on the leagues, teams, associations, um, conferences, all the different aspects of divisions of sports. Are so, are so integral into how we do this. And we have great partnerships, our, like a partnership with the NFL, which has been a longstanding relationship with us. We do the Super Bowl, the draft. Um, we do the Hall of Fame, um, Pro Bowl, and so many other aspects of the, of the NFL. But the NFL is, is, is a great partner in helping us think through and give uh, unique, unique products and access to things that really make the fan experience incredible. Uh, and having a great partner like the NFL, or as I described, Major League Baseball, or the Olympics, which we're doing next summer in Paris, um, that really makes a difference. I mean, look, Jim, there's a million ways to go get a ticket. You know, all a ticket is is a permission to sit in the seat. An experience <laughs> is something completely different. An experience is something that you, you want to tell people about. And some of it is the experience of what you saw. But a lot of times it's the experience of what you did and how you felt. And that's what On Location does so, does so uniquely. So for like the Olympics, uh, many people have gone to Olympics and, some, and even more people have never gone to an Olympic. But this is the first time that the Olympics has ever been opened up on a global basis to have a true hospitality and experience model. And we are, we are the global hospitality partner to the Olympics. And the kind of experiences that our guests are gonna have go way beyond a ticket or way, way beyond a hotel room. And who are your customers, Paul? Is it individuals or is it mostly corporate? Uh, I, I have, uh, I'm a wealth management, RIA. I have uh, a dozen of my top clients I'd like to bring and, and put on experience. Who is your customer? So we have a wide range of customers. You know, our customers for IMG are people who just love what, they, what they're going to say, whether it's Barbie, the Miami Open, golf event, Harry uh, Potter experience, Harry Potter, whatever it is, they just love it. They want to go right on location comes in and that that customer is somebody who wants more than just to go. Now, it could be an individual who thinks of it as a bucket list. We have many people who come to the final four, which we do all the NCAA championships, all of them, um, wrestling, basketball, 
uh, softball, baseball, you name it, we do them all. And our partners at the NCAA knows there's enthusiasts who just want to go to every NCAA Final Four. Those are people who do, or just want to go to one. Those are buckets. Those are people. And how do they come? Do they come to uh, on location site? Do they go to the NCAA site? How do how do you reach your public? All of the above. So we we they come to us on our site. We have a direct sales team that works with more custom programs. Um, the, our partners site often participate as well, uh, and you and it's promoted everywhere. You know, most of the time, if you search for uh, NCAA Final Four tickets, uh, our our sites usually come up. Now, sometimes we're branded on location. Sometimes we're branded with the with the actual rights holder. So UFC, it's UFC VIP, and a UFC experience is a true VIP experience, and it's bought through UFC VIP, provided by on location, of course. But but it's, so it's not about on location. It's really about our partner and giving that that customer the partner experience so back to who's the customer it's individuals people on bucket list people who are fans of who's playing or singing or act you know or participating um it's also businesses who want to entertain customers uh, uh whether on a small level maybe two tickets all the way up to a macro level with hundreds of tickets with a much larger so th those corporate customers paul i assume are both in venue or uh, associated with the venue advertisers as well as people who aren't advertisers but still want to entertain their their closest clients in a in, in a bucket list kind of experience sure we have companies that we do all of their customer entertainment experiences for them so any customers sales incentive trips uh customer uh staff rec recognition things like that retirement parties 50th birthday parties, you name it. We'll do, We it's, it, the motive of why they come to us is varied, but what they're coming to us for is very, is very similar. They want to have the best experience at the most incredible events. So tell me about Barrett Jackson. I, I, I think that's so clever that you took a car show and made it each time it becomes a bigger and, um, uh, and more entertaining event. What kind of a VIP package would I be, able to think about with uh, uh, the car enthusiast in my life who I want to have that bucket list kind of experience. So Barrett Jackson, for those who don't know, is where car car collectors come to find vehicles. Um, it's where car uh, sellers, people who have cars of value, whether historical, unique, or even like emotional significance, um, come to sell them. Uh, some some of the cars are very old. Some of them are uh, retro, resto mods, which are older cars that are built rebuilt for modern standards. Um, so some of them are celebrity owned cars that are just so unique because they were owned by someone special. I mean, there's a wide range. And so there's the cars that come to be sold. There are people who come to buy it. And then there are the people who come to watch it all. And there's a whole range of all three. And Craig Jackson, who he and his family um, are part of the founding group, and Carolyn, his wife, are deeply involved in the team, has done a great job building four unique uh, auctions a year that are, are uh, each one of them have a unique character. We're doing one next weekend in New Orleans, and then come February, we're going to be uh, in, in back in um, Scottsdale for our, our biggest, you know, our big, big, big auction, which is a multi-day auction. So how many shows are there under the Barrett Jackson brand a year? There are four big ones a year. You can buy a ticket and just watch. You just walk in, you know, in, in, um, in Scottsdale, we'll have tens to hundreds of thousands of people do that. Bidders, you can come and just register to bid and you can just stand there and do that. Then there's experiences. You can be have unique access and what we call the staging lanes. We can watch the cars from a very unique vantage point come in to go to the auction block. You can have a, a special viewing area that has incredible elevated hospitality, direct access viewing, but also special um, uh, people, uh, auctioneers who sit in those sections with you to help you through your bidding process so that you you, you build a relationship with them. Sure, sure. There's going to be, you know, concerts that we do, culinary experiences that you do. Um, 
And there's and and also there's an opportunity to be in Craig's box where you can Craig Jackson where you can be in his, in in that area. And each one of these, of course, have different price points attached to it, but with it comes very different immersive experiences. Look, you could always go to the Barrett Jackson auction and have an incredible time. Yep. But to sit in one of these uh, luxury boxes and and to see that auction experience from where the state being the staging lane, that it's an elevated experience that people write home about. Let's go backwards. Uh, where did you grow up, Paul? I grew up in northern New Jersey in a town called Cliff Lake. Oh, sure. And, but how did you wind up going to Indiana? It's huh, a good question. So um, it's a podcast into itself. So <laughs> I, my whole life, uh, my dad's a dentist. My mom was a hygienist. My grandfather, who unfortunately passed before I was born, but he was a dentist. So I kind of grew up in the world of dentistry. And yeah, sure. so the way I grew up is I just always tracked myself that I would become a dentist. So I did my whole education Primary education was really to, that was my ultimate outcome. And coming out of high school, that was my path. So I got into a program right out of high school that combined undergrad and grad into a dental program. And uh, it was it was in my intended path. After a year of it, which was nearby in New Jersey, it was a, a, a school called Fairleigh Dickinson that had a really good dental school. Um, and a, and a, it also had an undergrad program, but it had a good dental school in the local area. And uh, so after a year of the undergrad piece of it, I saw, I got open, my eyes open to a wider range. And now leading up to it. Wow, there's other options here. There's other <laughs> options, but leading up to it, I was an entrepreneur too. I had a business from when I was 10 years old on. I was, I was a magician and then I had, I did uh, birthday parties and things like that. And so no I, built, I still business doing that. I, I, and I would do, I, I just loved business. So I kept doing that. And I thought, you know what? I got to combine either combine dentistry and business, which I had ideas to do. Well, you could make I cavities need, disappear. Yeah, I mean, or, yeah, exactly. Or I need to do something <laughs> different. So after a year of it, I felt like I needed to do something different. So what I really loved was business, of course, but I love entertainment. I'm a musician. Um, I love sports. Um, so I still, did, da still dabble in uh, magic. I haven't done it in a long time, but, <laughs> uh, but I do still have a couple of tricks in my basement that for my for my kids and potential grandkids at some point. And also the influence of my father. My father was a magician growing up as well. And that's and I started off using his tricks, which was my first tricks that I, that I did. So after the year of undergrad, I decided I need to switch out of dentistry. But I knew that being at Fairleigh Dickinson wasn't the right place for me. I needed to go somewhere else. So uh, so I ended up coming home and talking to my parents about it. And they said, okay, we totally think you should do that, but you can't just sit home. It's, it's the end of June. You have to go back to school in September, pick a place and go. So I didn't know where to go. So I happened to be watching HBO and Breaking Away came on. And oh, sure. I, oh my God, what a great place. I love <laughs> basketball. Bobby Knight is there. I, that's where I want to go. So I called up, found out how to apply, sent my application in, got accepted a week or two later. And then two weeks after that, packed up my car and drove out to Bloomington. Never been there before. Never even saw it before. Wonderful uh, place, right? It was fantastic. So that's how I ended up there, is a combination of breaking away and not wanting to be a dentist. So uh, tell me your career path now after Indiana. So I, I got, I worked in an ad agency called J. Walter Thompson out of college. Sure. Um, a storied agency. <laughs> it was fantastic. And, uh, and then I left there to sell advertising for USA Today. Um, where then, uh, and then from there, I took one quick step over to a, a magazine called psychology today, and then over to people magazine. And I joined people very young. I was 25 years old. So it's just a couple of years out of school. Um, but I joined as a sales rep there and that's really where I spent the bulk of my career. I was there for almost 24 years. Yeah. You remember Liz O'Neill an editor? Of course. Uh, she's, she's terrific. Uh, haven't seen her in a bit. But she wrote a uh, she did a piece, one of the first podcasts, uh, she did a piece on uh, investigation of the Chappaquiddick incident uh, with Ted Kennedy, Mary Jo Kopechny. And I remember uh, five or six years ago when that came out uh, on my Saturday morning jogs, listening to that and deciding to double and go for another three miles 
because the uh, her podcast was so good I didn't want to stop listening. And uh, she's uh, she's a nice lady. I've gotten to know her a little bit uh, locally. We've had her at the ball games. She and her son, just a wonderful lady, and she's been there a long time. You've been there a long time. I um, so she, you're you're very fit, and uh, so you owe your fitness to her, I guess. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> or at least a bad knee. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, timing for a long time, huh? So I worked at timing for a long time. I had many jobs and really great opportunities. And all of what I learned a lot of things there, um, certainly about brands, about leadership, um, about entrepreneurism, um, about uh, business in general, uh, partnerships, relationships, uh, and, and, and made some of my best friends there as well and business associates. I left there to be a CEO of a radio company originally called Dial Global that we renamed to Westwood One. So a lot of yep. people know Westwood One. And then um, I was fortunate enough to uh, work with Cumulus to purchase Westwood One. And after they purchased it, I then joined Bloomberg uh, as the global chief revenue officer on the media side. Um, and then I left Bloomberg to basically focus on my family and uh, and my entrepreneurism by you know, investing and spying into small businesses, which I really enjoyed until I really missed being part of a team and being back in the, uh, in the game, as they say. And that's when I came to join Endeavor. And how does that come about that you joined Endeavor? A headhunter seek you out? Uh, uh, you, you put out the word in your community of friends saying, I'm looking to do something different? No, not at all. Actually, one of the main reasons I left Bloomberg was because my wife said to me, you're, you're, I have three kids. And my boys were just finishing up high school. And she said, you're missing everything. You're traveling all over the world. You're missing <laughs> everything. And I need you to stop working so that you can focus on your family, focus on yourself, focus on uh, what really matters. And, and also, she always said, you always wanted to do this on your own. Just go do it. So she encouraged that. And it became something that I really, uh, really, really got excited about. And I did. And... Then when the boys went off to college and and uh, and I was you know was just doing my independent thing, um, she noticed that I was bored in a way. Even though it was exciting and I was doing a lot of great things, she said, "You you kind of miss it, don't you? You miss being in the middle of it all." And I said, "I do." She said, "So why don't you go get another job then?" And I said, "Well, I actually don't want another job." And she said, <laughs> "Well, why?" And I said, "Because I like this." I said, but what I really want to do is to work for someplace special. And I want to work for someone incredibly special. And she said, well, who? And I said, there's literally only one person I'll go work for. And that's Mark Shapiro. And it's someone who I knew for a while before that. And I knew Ari very well before that. And yep. I had talked to them about other things over the years. But um, I... Uh, but I, but I just knew I wanted to work with Mark and frankly, I didn't even care what I was going to do. I, so I called him up under my wife's encouragement and, and he saw me of course, cause we had known each other for so long time. And I just said very simply, Mark, I don't know if you have anything. I don't even know if you want anything. I would, you know, I, I would do it for anything you want for whatever you want. I just want to be in that environment, in this company and with you, because this is a winning company and you are incredible incredible leader. He's literally the best. And How clever. Uh, and so he, he said, look, we're looking at getting into the event business with on location. Would you take a look at it with us and be part of that? And so I worked with the diligence team and, and the diligence team here on, on, on the M&A team on, at Endeavor is extraordinary. Um, and I, and busy. <laughs> and busy. And, and in working with them uh, when Endeavor ultimately did buy on location, they asked me if I would run it. And of course I wouldn't say no, because, you know, you went, went in life, you get to work with someone extraordinary like Ari and Mark in a company like Endeavor on brand like on location um, and, uh, and, and, and do the things we get to do. So it's been a privilege. And, and oh. IMG came across last year, a year ago is when uh, they asked if I, if I would bring that into the portfolio. And of course, it was run by an incredible executive in Sam Zussman, who now runs uh, over down in, in, in Barclays and in the, in the Brooklyn Nets. He, he did an incredible job at IMG events, and uh, and it, it just was a, it, it was a good opportunity for the company, but I was more than privileged to do that. I'd like to explore a little bit Endeavor and the incredible 
company it's become. But before we go there, I, I hate to toss a little lob up at the net to to uh, a Jimmy Connors type, but uh, what's in it for advertisers? My impression is that event sponsorship, either you have to be able to, you can't just buy the sponsorship. You have to consider the investment as part of a package, including what they call the merchandising of it. And how do you, how does, and it seems like it's only for big companies who have the resources to bring their clients into the entertainment part of it, merchandise it against the, the consumer base effectively. Is that the right way to think about it? Or are there cases where companies have built their brand by doing events? I think a five hour energy as maybe a company that came from the event world, its brand was launched by doing events, but tell me how I should think about that as a, as a small business person looking to say, what's a creative way for me to extend my brand and connect with my consumers in a, in a different way. We should examine it in two parts. When you think about media, you think about media as it relates to how do we communicate and tell stories and why do we communicate and tell stories? And the core of media is really simple. It's designed to inspire, ed, uh, educate, uh, or inform, I should say, or entertain. So those are the three, and these are well-known things. This is what we learn in school all the time, the three aspects of what media is. And the platform of that communication could be on anything. You know, in the olden days, it was divided by actual media platforms. Now it's mostly influenced by digital and social and so many different aspects, but the way we communicate goes in either video, text, or audio. And yep. those, those ways, the way to go. So that's how you tell stories. And that story can be long form or short form. And this podcast is an audio story, also a video story, the way we're doing it today. And, and that, and we're informing and maybe entertaining, hopefully inspiring. Maybe we're doing all three, but we, there's a purpose to that. When you're a marketer, you have to think about how do you communicate your story to better tell your message, to inspire the outcome that you desire. And Jim, this is one of the things that you are absolutely a genius at. I mean, what you did in the way you built your company through uh, audio is one of your primary tools. And you did a brilliant job of using your voice and your brand to tell your story to differentiate your product, which could have been considered a commodity, but it ended up being a differentiated story because you used the medium to tell your story well, and it communicated well to get people to buy more of your products. That is what anyone does on a small scale to the most extraordinary scale. The other parts that have become really important is how do you uh, create the value of story? What we're realizing now is we always thought of what we call influencers and influencers where everybody had an influencer in their life. It's the person who is in your life that helped you to be inspired to do whatever you did, right? Who's the person in the new neighborhood you call and say, hey, I need a pediatrician. You got it. That's an influencer. Now, influencers are way bigger than that, right? Social media has created macro you know, influencers, mega influencers. They, they give them a megaphone, right? And they give them a megaphone and they get paid a lot to it. So they became an advertising medium. So it became more than just reach an influencer to influence a, a group. It's now reach an influencer, pay them to become your platform. And so that's changed a lot. So as a small, as a large business, you have to look at all the tools and sponsorship comes into there as well. Big names like MetLife Stadium, big name on a logo means something. A patch means something because it's the reminder. It's the recall. It's it's people need to be told what they want because otherwise they don't know what they want it. And uh, and the from a small business perspective, you can do that too. You just have to make different choices because your budgets are smaller. You can't. You have to be more uh, assured of success. But the fundamentals are very similar. So thinking about how to tell your story to the people that you can grab most. So if you're a local retailer, how do you get people in that local market? Well, digital's got a great platform for that. We have social media. Um, we've got uh, outdoor advertising. Um, we have specials, um, email campaigns, great ways to recontact. And, that, and we just have to be smarter about it. And that's where the role of agencies play. Now, 160 over 90, which is a branded agency in Endeavor, does a great job of that for their customers. They help customers tell stories in every aspect. Uh, and that storytelling could be also in live event. And that's where we get involved with all of our partners internally and externally to help them tell their stories in live events too. 
whether it's through sponsorships or integration. Barbie was full of that. Um, Honeyland has many of those. And we and and it's a way to do that. The other way to tell the story is to entertain them, to tell them the story directly or inspire them by having them be your guest as an incentive for being a great customer. That's where experiences come in. So it's a multi multi-dimensional approach. As you look back at the company, what what's what might it become next? I have no idea what's going to come next, but I can assure you, because of the genius of Ari, it's going to be incredibly exciting. You know, Ari, Ari is a, uh, I've known Ari for a long time because when I was at People, Ari was an important partner to us because of the world and the celebrity that we all lived. And every interaction I ever had with Ari, I walked away even more inspired than I was before um, because he sees the world so differently than anybody else. He's a true visionary. He truly knows how to develop and create. Uh, he's a relationship person. Uh, he's in, he knows how to lead a team. He's really one of the most uh, impactful people in the world of business, not just in entertainment and sports. That's a, that's a whole uh, family of uh, uh, underachievers, huh? <laughs> Three brothers. <laughs> that, that family is incredible on every level, and there are and uh, and every one of them. There's a common trait amongst all of them, and but they do it express it in three different ways or in multiple different ways. Um, and then the combination of Ari and Mark is beyond extraordinary. Um, so when you're in a company, and the, and the depth of talent goes very wide and deep in this company. So it's not limited to any one area or any couple of people. It's very, my, the, the people I get to work with in every aspect of this company is a true leader and a true visionary for what their, their expertise. And, uh, and everybody plays a role in the opportunity ahead. Um, so I don't know where the company is ultimately going to go. It's not my my role here, but I can show you that I'm extremely proud and excited to be here. So tell me uh, about uh, uh, IMG events and on location. Uh, what's next? More properties? Is owning properties uh, something that's on your agenda to continue to develop new ones? Is it all of the above? Work with properties that exist? Work with licensed partners? Well, we're certainly not a static organization. We're going to constantly evolve and move. And we're, we're launching new products all the time. I would say right now, of course, we're looking as far out as we possibly can. But at the same time, we're looking very close um, because we have a lot of events coming up that we want to, uh, to bring to market and are bringing to market. But also we learn from each of them. I'd say one of the biggest learning experiences we'll have is the Olympics next summer in Paris. It's got to be an extraordinary challenge and an, an enormous opportunity for you to really have people rethink how they might enjoy, experience, and consume the Olympics. A hundred percent. And uh, and for anybody who comes with us as a guest is going to see the Olympics like it's never been seen before. But this is also the first live fan Olympic for the Summer Games in over eight years. And uh, so for a generation who never really got to go to the Olympics, certainly not one in a beautiful city like Paris at this time, uh, this is gonna be a real moment. So I would tell you that tickets are gonna be really hard to come by, hotel rooms are gonna be really hard to come by. So planning that trip and being part of it sooner than later is, is my best advice. But we're gonna learn a lot about where the future of experiences are gonna go by watching and seeing the, the wide range of global participants who are coming to, to with us to those games. And it's going to give us an opportunity to see what kind of other global expansion we could do, what other ideas we can do, and also more importantly, what we could bring to our existing partnerships. I mean, our existing partners are ones that we feel very deeply passionate about, and we look for every which way to nurture and grow and differentiate them. Um, so every time we do anything, we think about how do we better serve them. So our network and partnership is uh, is benefits with all of the the uh, of all the aspects of what we do. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, three children, Paul. Would you encourage them to go into your world? So my children are in their twenties. You mentioned one was a musician. So my youngest one is a musician. He's a working musician. This is uh, he. He breathes music. He's always has his whole life. It's his. It's the air he breathes. It's the delight he has. Um, he teaches and he performs. He writes. He produces. He's uh, he's he's living his life. He's twenty four years old and he's doing great. My middle one uh, is twenty six. He's a chemical engineer and he works uh, in pharmaceuticals, uh, making 
uh, vitamins and uh, for a major company. And then my oldest is 29 and she is uh, just graduated with her MBA and she just joined a consulting company and uh, in marketing consulting. So in many ways, the three of them are different components of my wife and I, and, but, but the one thing I love about them is they are living their own dreams. Each one of them is pursuing something completely different. I do not have one child who's following in any direction that either my wife nor I did. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, you have to have so many different skills in your role and awareness of so many different parts. It's 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 the ultimate orchestration company out there. There's so many things you have to think about and be able to access people, deploy people. And I would think that someone who grows up on the implementation side of your world are kind of people that other employees are going to want to hire because they just know how to get things done. The vast group of people who work here um, have a unique opportunity because one, they get to see the most incredible things and be part of it. Um, whether they love art and are part of Freeze or they love sports and can go to the Super Bowl, whatever it is, they, they, they get a front row seat to the most extraordinary moments. And when you go to any of these events, which I get to go to many of them, it's really wonderful to see the people who work there. What I also see is the growth that each and every one of those uh, colleagues that I have in every facet of this business the growth that they, they get. I benefited from the early parts of my career. I certainly benefited from the middle parts of my career and I benefit from my career every single day. I feel I never stop learning. I continue to grow and everything that I am and do is because of what I've done. And so getting the opportunity that every one of my colleagues do to do what they do in the company that they do it in is not only something that they could do in this company forever, uh, certainly, we don't want to lose anybody, but if for those that go on, they go on and do really extraordinary things. Well, uh, Paul, you've given us some really interesting insights into A, you and your career, which is quite amazing, and into the very interesting industry that we're in now. And we can only anticipate uh, the kinds of things you'll be involved in in the future. And we'll we'll be checking in to see all the, the new events and new uh opportunities to think about participation in a sporting event with a culinary experience, a wonderful trip on the side, exposure to some good music in town while you're there. It just uh, it seems to be no end to the possibilities. And, and congratulations on what you've done, what you're doing, and more importantly, what we expect you'll be doing in the future. So thanks for sharing those insights with us. I have so many more things I'd like to talk to you about. We could use your help uh, in our marketing world here to figure out how do we do things different to build more relationships with more people and help them to have more relationships and better relationships in their life. Because if we do that, our selfish motivations are there are going to be more birthdays, more anniversaries that they'll want to remember. So we're in a relationship business too, but you're the provider of the venue and the opportunity to really nurture and develop relationships. So I think at the end of the day, we're in very similar businesses. <laughs> we really are. And I really appreciate that very much. And Jim, I want to see you in one of our, either at a, one of our events or our experiences. I think you'd really enjoy it. Well, uh, Paris, it sounds like there could be some good food involved and <laughs> I'm not missing that. And golf, great golf. Is that, that's sure, sure. Paul, thanks so much. Thank you too, Jim. It was good to see you.